I'm Matt Martin, but Dave King's out. Sitting with me is Paul Arbeen, and it's 708, 36 degrees outside. But also, we have a guest right now. Tibor Naj is, is in the studio. You can tell us, you know. Good morning. Good morning. Here in the United States, I don't know that we truly comprehend the ramifications of what Donald Trump did yeah. last last Friday. Yeah, it's a, it's an enormous step, mostly symbolic. I, I, I think to truly understand as somebody, I mean, you really do have to understand the concept of Jerusalem historically. It's one of the oldest cities in the world. It has uh, been attacked about 55 times in its history. It's changed uh, regimes about 44 times. You know, the conqueror moved in and took over. There have been three occasions in history when Jews were actually not allowed to live in Jerusalem. Two of those occasions were actually under Christian rule. When uh, in the Byzantine Empire, when uh, one of the Byzantine queens kicked the Jews out, uh, and then when the Crusaders took over Jerusalem, they butchered almost all the Jewish and Muslim inhabitants. And it was uh, when the Muslims took it back that they welcomed the Jews back in. Uh, During the Ottoman times, when the Turks ruled Jerusalem, that's when all the people who lived there kind of had their golden time because the city was divided into four quarters, given the holy sites for Christianity, Islam, and of course Judaism. And there was the Armenian quarter, the Christian quarter, the Muslim quarter, and the Jewish quarter. Then uh, after World War II, you know, when Israel became a state, uh, Jerusalem was divided after the initial war between Israel and Jordan. Jordan kept what is now East Jerusalem, uh, and Jordan had most of the holy sites. Jordan took a pretty good care of it, and then when Israel in the 67 war took over the whole city, mm-hmm. keeping the sites fell to them, but the, the Israeli government actually had an Islamic council take care of the, the Temple Mount. Mm-hmm. You know, what is the Temple Mount is because it's, it's very holy to, of course, both religions. Right. Now, of course, uh, you know, you have the Palestinians <laughs> saying that the Jews really don't have a case to for Jerusalem, which is hogwash. Right. Because, right. of course, you know, uh, for, it, it, Jerusalem's, what, 3,000 years old, and out of that, for about 1,000 years, it was it was under under the Jewish occupation. But the situation is, is so, so convoluted. A lot of people don't realize we already have a diplomatic establishment in Jerusalem, because we have the embassy in Tel Aviv, but we actually have a consulate general in East Jerusalem, mm-hmm. which actually serves... Palestinian clientele, because today Jerusalem is a is a totally divided city. Yeah. There are Jewish quarters, there are Muslim quarters. Right. So, you know, that kind of brings us up to date. The uh, Israeli Neset, Isla- Israeli parliament, I think, in 1950, passed a law declaring Jerusalem to be the capital. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you a question uh, about Israel, and uh, of course, this is not directly related to the Jerusalem issue. Right. Uh, of course, the Knesset has been meeting there, you know. Absolutely. So it, it's, Absolutely. It's, historically, it's yeah. the capital of it. Mean, Absolutely, yeah. Right. I, everyone but knows. <laughs> my question, uh, I want to move forward to 1947. Right. Uh, did the British cause all of this problem when, in my view, maybe they just threw the Jews to the wolves and pulled out? Yeah, the, 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 Brit- the British were not very good at managing the situation, but we also have to remember the British had been through hell, basically, with World War II, and they had problems. All- they had the largest colonial empire. At one time, I think, Britain ruled, what, one-third of the entire world? Uh, uh, right. And their colonies everywhere were going up in flames. So from the British point of view, this was a relatively minor issue. And the reason, of course, they had the obligation was because of the, horrend- the horrendous Holocaust. Right. At that point, the civilized world carried a huge guilt trip over this, so they said, you know, we have to do something. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they did, but their, their heart was just not in it. Their heart was not in keep, you know, separating the, uh, the Jews from the Palestinians. And to be fair, you know, the Palestinians started the violence. Right. I mean, starting in World War One, the Jews kind of had to organize themselves into self-defense units. What you had, though, you had Europeans, Jewish Europeans, who were advanced, educated, modern, coming into a land that was still in many ways a medieval area with, you know, ag- uh, agro-settlers, very uneducated, very few people had gone to school there. So very quickly, the Jewish population coming in 
you know, established themselves and was far and above advanced over the other population, and of course that caused a lot of resentment. Right. Well, it's I happened to visit with a gentleman years ago who was a captain in the British Army who mm-hmm. uh, was involved in the exodus, uh, you know, mm-hmm. to Israel and then the pullout. And, of course, immediately after the pullout, you know, oh, yeah. oh. Israel was hanging on by their fingernails. And all hell broke. Right, right absolutely. Broke loose. So, okay. uh, I, I just I, I yeah. was very, very interested in yeah. your opinion on no, that they, issue. No, they totally mismanaged it. But remember also that, uh, I mean, they kind of threw their hands up when it was Israeli group, the Irgun, I think, that blew up the King David Hotel, which was where all the British officers were staying. Right. And because the— uh, the Israeli radicals at the time wanted the British out of the way because they saw what was happening and they felt like the British was on the side of the, the Palestinians. All right. So Good point. As far as, as the declaration that the United States made, as far as I know, there's no other country except for Israel that claims that, that, that even recognizes Jerusalem I, as— it's, I don't think it's that clear-cut. I think most of the world has this attitude— that uh, it, oh my gosh, it's, it's such a hot issue. Let's put it on the table and let's let the Israelis and Palestinians decide, you know, as one of the end stages mm-hmm. of the negotiation. Because, you know, when you undertake a very, very serious, heated negotiation, the way to succeed is you start with a low hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. You know, what shape is a table going to be? Yeah. And then who's going to sit where? And then you kind of move from there. And this would have been one of the very, very last issues. And here's the other interesting thing is, if you survey the Jewish residents of, of Jerusalem and the Palestinian residents of Jerusalem, they see things totally se- in a self-centered way. Mm-hmm. So the Palestinians see X as Jerusalem, the Jews see Y as Jerusalem. The one big issue, of course, is the Temple Mount. Yeah. You yeah. know, that, that, that is the one that everybody cares about. As far as that neighborhood or that neighborhood, who, you know, who runs that one, they don't, they don't really care. Mm-hmm. But, it, but that Temple Mount, they do. You, you know, th- think back. There was one other capital city which was kind of split up, and that was Berlin. Right. Everybody knew Berlin was the capital of Germany. <laughs> After World War II, there was East Germany and West Germany. East Germany had its capital in East Berlin. West Germany could not because there was no contiguous West German territory that touched Berlin. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, West Germany would have had their capital in West Berlin Mm -hmm. instead of Bonn. And, of course, once you had unity, you know, it it went back to to being one city. So there is precedent for, you know, kind of having a split capital because it it is two cities. Once we had uh, unity, so to speak, uh, a.k.a. the Berlin Airlift, uh, yes, <laughs> right. Which uh, literally saved oh, exactly. hundreds of thousands it's of lives. Absolutely, okay, because well, the Soviets were going to starve them to death. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to have to go ahead and take a break, and we'll come back and uh, with a few more questions for T. Bordnaj. This is News Talk ninety five point one FM and seven ninety AM KFYO. All right, I'm Matt Martin. Dave King is out. Um, we're going to go right to T. Bordnaj because we only have you for one more segment, I think. But. Mm-hmm. Um, so you were telling us that there's there's some overarching issues in the yeah. Middle East right now yeah. that that I, I I think it's a really important to think about that what what are U.S. overall interests in the Middle East because they, they have changed dramatically because the traditional U.S. interests in the Middle East were one keep the Soviet Union out mm-hmm. well there's no more Soviet Union two was to guarantee a supply of petroleum and energy to the United States of America. We no longer need that region because, thank goodness, North America, Canada, Mexico, U.S. has become energy independent. Mm-hmm. We're exporting oil. Absolutely. <laughs> We're fantastic. So we don't need that anymore. Then we had to make sure that Israel survived and was protected. After the Israeli-Egyptian agreement and with all the weapons that Israel has now and all the other turmoil in the Middle East, there is no danger longer to the state of they're, Israel. They're too busy fighting each other to exactly. fight and, and to be truthful, the Israelis have now built up phenomenal under-the-table working relations mm-hmm. with people like Jordan, with the Saudi Arabians. I mean, Saudi Arabia and, and Israel and, and Bahrain, and Israel, they, they exchange intelligence information mm-hmm. because they all now foresee Iran as, as the greater threat. So, you know, our, our interests are no longer the same and we're trying to figure out what are our key interests in the in the Middle East. At one time, that was the one critical region. 
Is it really in our interest now to guarantee the safety of the Red Sea, for example, so the Chinese could ship their oil to right. China? You know, because in, a, in effect, we are protecting Chinese uh, supplies of energy. Mm -hmm. I know it's impossible to put it into a word, but what is our Middle East policy now? And if you had your way, what would it be? Well, I, I think our Middle East policy is the polite diplomatic term would be uh, evolving. The, <laughs> In other words, uh, the, we don't the, know. The realistic <laughs> term would be would be unclear. Uh, right. Yeah. And, it, it, and and then there was always this far away, you know, vision. But we never really acted on it because we didn't want to offend our key Middle East allies, which was promoting democracy and human rights. Because, you know, we always say we're out to promote democracy and human rights in the world. But in the Middle East, have we ever said to the Saudis, oh, you really need to be a democracy and get rid of your king? Of, of course not. <laughs> right. Or did we ever say that to the Shah of Iran when the Shah of Iran was our, our key ally? Of, of, of well, course we certainly not. didn't do it here because we had the prince living here in Lubbock and uh, <laughs> exactly. pilot training at Reese Air Force Base. Yeah. Exactly. So, so we, we, we really do need to sit down and kind of as a government, you know, with the consent of the people, figure out, okay, what are our current interests in the Middle East? I would say, well, and, and another big one, of course, recently has been to kill off the Islamic State. But that was a very short-term interest. We basically succeeded that. The problem is now that we, along with the Russians and Saudis and the Turks, have killed off the state of the Islamic State, but the conditions still remain that created their reason of being. Yeah, so, the guerrillas are still there. And and the unfairness of the society, you know, uh, people feeling disenfranchised, the, uh, the thumping uh, Arab preachers out there saying, you know, mm -hmm. the infidels have to go and get rid of the crusaders. So that is still there. So I, I think that we need to be focusing on stabilizing the, the Middle East so that we don't have any more of these poisonous groups coming over here trying to blow up our subway stations. All right. Well, uh, Honestly speaking, the last attempt had to be the dumbest suicide bomber I've ever <laughs> yeah, met. Yeah, well, he well, kind of messed up a little bit. The, the, you know, unfortunately, that's the good news with these yeah. inspirational activities yeah, is sure. that they tend to be amateurs. The bad news is no one ever knows where, where they're coming next. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, I was on the sub Washington subway a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, you pull into the Pentagon station— at, at rush hour, and you say to yourself, oh, my gosh, I hope that no crazy person, <laughs> you know, wants to make a mark right here. I feel that way now in any type of crowd, Yeah. Uh, regardless of where I am. I'm, I'm uncomfortable at a football game because I know that I am no longer in control. I can no longer protect those that are with me, yeah. and it's pretty frightening. And that's and that that in effect is a terrorist goal, you know, because they are yeah. terrorists. They want to terrorize right. us as a society, not just as individuals. But when all individuals start feeling like you do, then we have a tendency to say to the government, "Protect us. We'll give up our rights." Yeah. Well, I'm not to that point yet. So good. <laughs> so we we only have a couple minutes left. Um, as far as North Korea, we've we've had uh, Kim Jong Un came out not that long ago, or at least the North Korean uh, people, uh, they came out and said that they are going to go to war with the U.S. It is just a matter of when. Yeah. It's, is, is that still no, just it's, a threat or it, just no, it's, empty it, words? It's, it's hyperbole, okay. but, but I'll, I'll be honest with you. I read an article on Sunday, Sunday's Washington Post, which I kind of read with holding my nose because I don't like the tilt of the paper, mm -hmm. but, but they do have some great analytical articles, and there was a piece in there on how war with North Korea could evolve, mm -hmm. and it was I, I highly recommend go online and read it. Because it uh, it's a dose of reality that really slapped me. Got in the about face. ten seconds. Do we have? Do you do you see North Korea really going to war with South Korea? Because that's what they want. They want I, the entire peninsula. Th they do, but I think they're counting on taking it over over the longer term without going to war. Yeah. Okay. They better All get right. them some groceries over there. So they better. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll be back with Jerry Reynolds after the break. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. Thanks.